Uh, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, if you would. We come back to this passage. I was thinking today, I can't believe I quit last week on the message, Can God Use a Quitter? <laughs> I didn't finish it, I quit on it. <laughs> oh, it's funny when it dawned on me today. You ever quit on God? Sure, we all have. You know, made commitments of not only going to read the Bible, but uh, settle that. Of course, years ago, I'm grateful, but sometimes we've made commitments about how much or how long we're going to read the Bible and be in prayer and, and then fail, quit on that. Or how about, I'm going to witness to someone every day, or I'm going to give out so many tracts a week, and then we, we quit on that. And I'm not going to do this sin anymore, or that sin, and then we quit on that. And I know that's been my experience in 30 years of being saved. Sure, we've quit on God over and over. But praise God, we have a God of second chances and third chances. Hallelujah. And uh, it takes a miracle, you know, sometimes. Uh, to get people faithful, faithful in any area. I'm so grateful for some of you that it doesn't matter what night of the week we have service. I know you're going to be here. You're, you're here for church. You're, you're going to be here for Sunday school. You're going to be serving in different things. But sometimes you, some people, it takes a miracle to get them faithful in some area, whether in serving or just attending. And then it seems like almost anything will get them to quit. Something happens. And the devil will make sure something happens to see if you're really serious about obeying God or not, you know. And, uh, and there's even been pastors that have quit, quit on uh, the proven methods of the scripture, quit on uh, the commands as, and principles of God's word, and some just quit on ministry all entirely and uh, walk away completely. You know, the problem with our country is not wicked people. The problem with our country is not worthless politicians. The problem with our country is weak we Christians. And so may God help us. So can God use a quitter? Well, let's read a little about the quitter. Acts chapter 4. Would you look there in verse 1? Acts chapter 4. And we give, gave us several of these points. We'll review and just get back into the message. I'm not going to keep you long tonight. Uh, I know uh, many of you worked hard today and so want to move right along with the message. But look at Acts chapter 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tied. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. It came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? By what name? That, that, that's where the boldness came from was the Lord. Or, wh where is this coming from? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The power of his name. Think of that. By what name, they asked in verse 7, verse 10, they said, G Peter said, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then in verse 12, he says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. Give it among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Come back to this title, Can God Use a Quitter? So can God use a quitter? I know as a boy there was times I was with a certain uh, neighborhood kid and my parents would know I'd been around him because he was a smart aleck and so I'd pick up things from him. I wonder how often we've been around Jesus and people, I mean these are lost people said, they took knowledge of them, verse 13, the end there, that they had been with Jesus. 
They could tell by the way they spoke, by the way they had boldness of life. Oh, my God, help us. Let's pray together. Father, help us tonight as we think of this thought. Lord, we know you know more than all. We've quit on you in many areas, and yet you've been such a forgiving, merciful, gracious God. Oh, Lord, we don't want to quit. We want to stay fast. We want to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We want to be faithful like you are. And I pray you'd help us to learn the lesson Peter learned that caused him to never backtrack again after he came through that denying experience and, and acts all the way through to the end. He was faithful. And I'll help us that we would not quit anymore, but be faithful as we see the same way he did. We can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Peter's boldness. I love his willingness to stand up for Christ. And, you know, oh, to have the boldness of Peter. Acts 2, he preached Pentecost. We'll see that in just a minute. And Acts 3, they look at this man and they say, listen, we don't have silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he does. I mean, just have the boldness to say that. And he does. Rise up and walk. Then chapter 4 in preaching. In chapter 5, he's standing up again. Uh, God using him and, and just the boldness and, and, the, and the power that came with his life. That wasn't in Peter. That was in the Lord. And so he caused others to see, as I've already mentioned, by his life, by his lips, that he'd been with Jesus. He'd been with Jesus. And the result was people were saved. And uh, it was obvious to them that Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible says as he's preaching to these rulers uh, verse 8 of, of chapter 4, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them. And so he was not walking in the flesh. He was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And God commands us, uh, Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so uh, that's the condition he was in. And God used that as he was in uh, under the control of God. And so it was obvious to these lost men that the boldness, where the boldness came from, it was directly related to having been with Jesus. And so if you and I were lacking that strength, that inner strength, that boldness to speak for Christ, that um, power on our life to see lives change and people saved, uh, I would say the same is true for us. The reason we have lack of power is our lack of spending time with the Lord Jesus. And so from this account, we see God using Peter, showing great courage and boldness. But was he always that strong for Christ? How was he able to stand for Christ? And last week, we sh shared three points on this. We shared the last two tonight. Number one, we shared delivered from sin. We see in John 1, he got saved. Praise the Lord. Andrew brought him to Jesus, John chapter 1 there. And uh, that's obviously the first step. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior tonight, you could never be filled with the Spirit of God and certainly wouldn't have the power of God on your life. And God couldn't use you to see souls saved, but he wants to. And he'll come into your life and save you if you'll turn to him, put your faith and trust in him. Repent of your sin. And so that's what happened with Peter. And, and here is Andrew's brother went and got him. I love that. And it brings him to Jesus. And I want to remind you as we go into, into anniversary Sunday, this, this, this coming Sunday, and the opportunity to invite people these next few days, you never know what God will do with the next person you bring to Jesus. Yeah. Andrew had no idea what Peter would become. Now, Peter might have been the worst sinner he knew. That's why he went and got Peter. You know, he was a cursing fisherman and he was hot headed and, and, and temper, you know, and we see that in the scriptures. And so uh, he said, this guy definitely needs Jesus and God likes to get great glory to himself. And he uses the most base and the most unlikely. And we praise God for that. And so Andrew had no idea. And I love that about Andrew. You see through the gospel records, you pay attention. Next time you read through the gospel records, Andrew's always bringing someone to Jesus, bringing people to Jesus. And what a testimony. Number two, we saw not only delivered from sin, he was desired by Satan. Luke 22, uh, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, unto him, Satan has desired to have you. He may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And so he's saying, when you come through this, when you come out the other side, I want you to strengthen your brethren. And of course, God will use them to do that. I believe through Acts, his ministry and first, second Peter is a result of that. But why was Satan after him? Well, he wanted to ruin him. He wanted to ruin his usefulness for Christ. Why is Satan after you? Same reason. Same reason. I was praying just a minute ago with Justin. I was asked, Lord, please keep people well. I made that was with Brother Kilpatrick during, during our prayer time down here. Please, please keep people well, uh, no sickness. Give us good weather Sunday. 
Well, people use any excuse, you know, to miss. And God's trying to work and draw them. And the devil is going to try to do some way distract them from being in God's house and hearing the preaching of God's word. And so um, why, does God, why does the devil after you? He want to ruin your usefulness for Christ. Uh, cursing fishermen's not much good for the cause of Christ. It brings reproach on the cause of Christ when he denies the Lord. And so that's where the devil wants to keep you and me. But God wants to use this testing in, in, in his life, even this failure in his life to build and strengthen him. Peter had to learn to die to the flesh, to die to self. And God's trying to teach him that. He had to learn like you and I have to learn. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. None of that verse is mine if I miss the part through Christ because I can't do anything without Christ. John 15 says, without me, you can do nothing. And then number three, we looked at that he denied the Savior. Denied the Savior. I can't imagine it in Luke 22 there. You're thinking, surely not Peter, the one that said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one that took the sword out and was willing to fight, you know, and all that he said. And not Peter that got out of the boat and walked on water, but sure enough, Peter... Who would have thought Peter with that boldness that he had so often would crumble like a coward by a little maid asking a question. So we saw Peter's failure. He denies Christ, cursing, swearing, trying to remove all doubt. And then we'll pick up, this is where we get in the new material, Luke 22. Let's pick up there. Luke 22, Peter's sorrow. You can imagine him cursing, swearing and just like you and I, when we do something we know we shouldn't have done or say something we know we shouldn't have said, immediately, because we're saved, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and you're just sick about it, you know. But here, it goes even further than just his own conviction. The Bible says in verse 61 of Luke 22, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. It's the third time, verse 60, man, I know not what thou sayest. Immediately the cock crows. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the cock crow, thou should not deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. I believe that look of Christ was a forgiving look. I believe, believe it was forgiving love that he looked upon him with. But Peter knew what have I done? The one that washed my feet, the one that saved me and changed my life, the one that I've seen do so many things. Why? I saw him raise the dead. Why am I betraying him like this? Why am I denying him like this? And it bitterly hurt him. This is a song um, by John Newton. You probably, I don't know, this is not familiar probably to most. Same man that wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton was a converted slave trader, a wicked, wicked, filthy mouth man. And a wicked sinner. But certainly this song applies to Peter's life. It was, it's called He Died for Me. And it goes like this in one of the stanzas. I saw one hanging on a tree. In agonies and blood, he fixed his languid eyes on me. As near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my dying breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death. Though not a word he spoke. And Peter goes out in the night that night, a broken man, a broken man, uh, probably thinking God could never use me now. He maybe could have before, but he could never use me now. And the devil is no doubt feeding that thought, that line of thinking, right? And then I want to remind you that principle, God only uses broken people. He weeps bitterly and I believe he's repentant, no doubt about it. He's sorry for what he's done. But the devil is taking him down this spiral. You see that over the next few chapters. We'll look at uh, the next point in just a second. But this was something Peter thought he would never do. And maybe you're here tonight and you say, I've done something. I've done maybe many things I never thought I would do. Pastor, my life is a broken mess. Well, I want to encourage you tonight. Bring the pieces to Jesus. God can make them over again. And he make you make it better than it ever was. You say, well, what is it? I, listen, you have nothing to lose. If it's a broken mess, bring it to Jesus and let God put it back together. Oh, friend, the pieces may not be much to you. You might think it's not worth much. The world might say it's not worth much, but the worth, 
the world to the Lord. They're a treasure to him. And number four, we see he ditched his service. Turn to John 21, would you? John 21. John 21, delivered from sin, desired by Satan, denied the Savior, and then he ditched his service. John 21, look at verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is the Sea of Galilee. It's also called Lake Chinnereth. And on this wise showed he himself. They were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Remember, Peter had said, I go a fishing. They say, we're going with you. Any decision you make always affects others. Good or bad. If you go on for God, you serve God with fervor, that'll impact others. You have enthusiasm for God. You are excited about serving God. You are passionate about serving the Lord. That'll affect others. But if you go back, if you backslide, if you um, get cold and lukewarm in your Christian life, if you, if you allow yourself to get complacent and apathetic, that also affects people. Uh, Peter didn't go fishing by himself. He's got half the disciples with him, a little more than half. The remaining disciples, think of this. Verse 3, Simon Peter said unto him, I go a fishing. They said to him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered his ship immediately. And that, that night they caught nothing. It's never profitable to go away from the Lord. Just ask Jonah. Never profitable to go the opposite direction of what God's given you to do. Verse 4, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Praise God, even when we go the wrong way, Jesus is there. Jesus is watching. He's walking away. He's walking away. He's walking away from all he said he was. He's walking away from all he's been acting for three and a half years. He's walking away. He's basically saying, I'm going back to the old life. I'm going back to what I was before I met Jesus. That's what he's doing. They'd, they'd given up their ships and walked away, but now he's going back to it. And remember, God had called Peter in that famous passage, Matthew 4, 19. But he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he left his nets, left everything, followed the Lord. And by the way, God's called every Christian to follow him. God's called you to follow him. Take up your cross daily, he said. Denying yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And Peter goes a fishing, back to his old life. But Jesus won't let him go. He cannot and will not let him go. And I want to tell you, Jesus is not going to let you go. He cannot let you go. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves us with an everlasting love, a love that will not let us go. Cannot let us go. I want to tell you, the love of God is so strong. Do you understand? The people that have rejected Christ and are in hell, God still loves them. He died for them. That's, that's God's love. It's unbelievable, the love of God. It's infinite. I've been studying on that and our next message in Ephesians. It's, it's unbelievable. The love of God. Well, he loved Peter like that. He loves you like that. Peter's restored by Jesus. Notice this. Chapter 21, verse 5 there. Then Jesus saith unto them, children, have you any meat? Answered, no. You can just hear those fishermen discouraged, you know. Y'all catch anything? No. Don't even want to talk about it. Nothing. He said unto them, cast it down the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. And Peter, though he was... A man's man, maybe we'll know as the sharpest guy, you know. <laughs> I love this part. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John often refers to himself as that and not, doesn't give his name. It's, this is talking about John, the, the human penman here. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that, and here comes the Simon Peter we all know and love. That it was the Lord. He girded his fishers coat on unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself in the sea. Now he was in his undergarments. Not, he just didn't have his outer coat on. All right. And if you study that time period and the terminology they'd use. Verse 8. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. You ever wonder where Jesus got those fish? I always wonder about that. He probably just put the pan out and said, to you, yeah, you two, jump in there. Well, I don't know. 
If it doesn't say it had a net, and I don't think they had fishing poles really. I don't know, maybe he had a line. But he had two fish anyway. That's not in the Bible, so we can't be dogmatic about it. But you can think about it what you want. But it's interesting, isn't it? Jesus says to them, he didn't need their fish. He already had his own fish. He had bread too. Bring in the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and three. And for all there were so many, it was not the net broken. Jesus said to him, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth him and fish likewise. And the Lord's waiting on them. The resurrected Christ is waiting on them like a wait, waiter at a diner. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. And so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Oh, there's so much preaching in this. I won't take the time, but you ever wonder, what's your these? Jesus was to look at your life today and say, lovest thou me more than these? He wasn't asking, do you love me more than the other disciples? He was saying, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than this life? Do you love me more than money? What's these? What's the these for you? What's your these? Do you, do you love me more than that? It's strong, isn't it? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, said to them, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said to him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And many believe because there's a threefold denial. There's a threefold questioning here. Three times he's, and, one, and once with an oath, cursing and swearing, you know. I don't even know him. Do you love me? Three times the Lord asks him here. He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith to him, Feed my sheep. It's threefold questioning. Verse 17, he saith, and in the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter's grieved because he said in the third time, lovest thou me? And we could talk about the different loves here. We'll get into all that. He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. And so a threefold questioning, uh, uh, forgiveness here, no doubt. He's saying, I still want you to serve me. I want you to feed my sheep. This commissioning. And then. Uh, he talks a little longer, talking about the death he's going to die. And at the end of verse 20, 19, he says, follow me. And Peter asks, what about John? And Jesus in verse 22, if I will, he tarry till I come. What's that to thee? Follow thou me. And so Peter, almost like a child here, he's having to, after three and a half years pouring into him, he's got to go and round them up again. It's like someone, you know, that misses church. They come a couple times and they miss. And, you know, you that are a spiritual person, you discipling them, you got to go visit them. Hey, what's going on? And you got to kind of round them back in, you know, like a baby spiritually here. God has to round them up again, get them back in the in the work here. Come on, let's get back to business here. Follow thou me. I love what J. Oswald Sanders wrote. Only the master, only the master could see in this cursing fisherman, the chosen preacher of the most vital sermon ever delivered in the history of the church. You understand less than 50 days from this day, maybe even less than three or four weeks at this point, it's the third time Jesus appeared to them. He's going to preach the message of Pentecost. This same guy. You and I, we'd never see that. Not Peter. Maybe God used John or Andrew, but not Peter. But God saw. And I want to say, you may think and others may think about you that God couldn't use you, but God can use you. God desires to use you. And do away exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think. Number five, lastly, he dynamically preached the sermon at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. This is the last. Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 14. Here, I love this. Peter boldly stands. He would do this all the way through the gospel records. But he was the spokesman for the disciples. And here they come asking a question. The Spirit of God has come down on them. And verse 11, the, the, like... Uh, they, they are all hearing in tongues the different wherever they grew up, the wonderful works of God. In verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? And others mocking said, These men are drunk. These men are full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the eleven. I love that. You've got to mark that, standing up. Peter, this boldness, see, the, the Spirit of God has done something. He's been, 
He's come through the testing and realized, I can't, I fail every time I do with my own strength. I've got to come in the power of God. That's why Ephesians 6, Paul wrote, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You're not strong, neither am I. My might's weak, not strong. I'm weak compared. But all oh, God's strength is what I need. So Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto you, hearken to my words. For those who are not drunken, as you suppose, see it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it's come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And he goes on preaching here. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter not only boldly stood, he boldly speaks. Verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. You guys, you were there. I saw you. You were there when we fed the 5,000. You were there too at the 4,000. You saw this. You were there raising the dead. That's what he's saying. You saw the wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Boy, what a message. He starts into David and Old Testament about this. Notice verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And rings like the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Or like the Ethiopian eunuch in the in the uh, uh, chariot there, Isaiah 53. Who's, who's this man, who's this guy talking about? The prophet or someone else? And he gets up there and gets to preach Jesus. Here they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all their far off, and as many as the Lord God shall call. With many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What boldness. You read about Pentecost, all you can say, look what God did. God used Peter because he had come to the end of himself. He had gone through all this. And listen, again, any one of us, if Peter was in this church and it denied the Lord like that Christian swearing, we saw that on the front page of the news. And uh, he's quit and he walked away and gone back to fishing. None of us would think in a few weeks that guy's going to preach this message. It makes, reminds us sometimes that we need to have mercy and grace on people. Uh, we need not give up on people so quickly. Because here the Lord restores them. Remember Galatians talks about uh, there's a brethren that's caught in some sin, ye which are spiritual, go to him to restore them. Meekness and fear. Watching yourselves, that they, yet, lest ye also be tempted. You could have fallen into that sin just as easily. That's what he's saying. It's only by the grace of God that the Lord's kept you and you've cleaved to the Lord. It wasn't your strength that kept you from doing wrong. It was his strength. And so... Uh, the Lord here restores him. And you think, how could this man who had denied the Lord at his death so passionately and cursing and swearing now preach so boldly and God bless it by his spirit and 3,000 people get saved? How? By the power of God. Through Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit moving and working. And I want you to know, no matter what you've done, doesn't no matter what's going on in your life, our God is a God of forgiveness and mercy and grace. And if you'll come to him, he will cleanse you. He says, if I confess that, um, yeah, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
That's not written to the lost man. That's a, mess, a, a verse to the believer, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. You say, you don't know what has happened. If you have confessed your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he'll use you. A just man falleth seven times. But he rises up again. I'm not saying go out and sin, of course. Shall we continue in sin that grace abound? Romans says, what? God forbid. Right? No. But if you have sinned, Praise God, there's forgiveness and God will help the work to cleanse you and help you and you can go on for God and can be used of God. Can God use a quitter? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Amen. Praise God, he can. Amen. But only if the quitter is willing to be used. Yeah. Only if they'll yield. Mm -hmm. Yield to the Lord and let God use you. Amen. God wants to use you. Say, so how could God use them? Only through the power and boldness that comes from the filling of the Holy Ghost. Walking with Christ. I love Peter's life because unfortunately we're more often than not like him. We'd like to be like Paul, but we're really more like Peter most of the time. But I want to encourage you, Peter didn't stay that way. He was a baby still. He was acting like a baby, acting like a child. And he would write, Paul would write, hey, let's not be tossed to and fro anymore like a child. All the winds of doctrine. It's time to grow up. It's time to walk on with God where it's not up and down and roller coaster Christianity. God wants you to grow through that. And Peter did. You don't find that in Acts. He didn't go back a fishing again. He doesn't deny the Lord again. He'll give his life for Christ. And you find him staying filled with the spirit, walking with God. And so if you want to have the boldness of Peter and be used of God, even though you've quit on God many times, then Jesus Christ is the source. Acts 4, 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived their unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They took knowledge of them. They'd been with Jesus. We're in a country full of quitting Christians. People quitting on so many things. Quitting on things that have been most surely believed among us for years and years. We're quitting on that. Letting all kinds of convictions and standards and so on go. Quitting on things. Quitting on this book. Believing the Bible is truly the word of God. Quitting on holiness and holy living. As Peter would write to us, be holy. For I'm holy. Quitting on witnessing. People have witnessed to their neighbors. They have witnessed to co-workers. Uh, you should not be that way. Lord, help us. Not, let's not quit on that. Let's keep on. Uh, quitting on having a truly Christian home. Truly being Christian through and through in every part of what they say, do, entertainment, music, every part. Reading the word of God and prayer, a Christian home. Some people go home from church and they're using curse words in their home, yelling and screaming at each other. May God help us. How do you stop quitting? How do you stop failing him? How do you have the boldness of Peter? Well, we've been preaching on it. Abide in him. Abide in him. Be with him. Be with him in his word. Be with him on your knees. Be with him living consciously in the presence of God. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He's right there. Acknowledge him. Oh, it'll give you strength to live right. Be with him in the services at church and worshiping the iron sharpening iron of, of God's people here. Worshiping together. Preaching and teaching the word. We all need that. This is where the endurance comes from. This is where the strength comes from. The power, the keeping on, keeping on. The boldness comes from, from walking with the Lord and his word and prayer. Meeting with him. People will take knowledge of you too. That you've been with Jesus. Oh my God, help us. Let's bow in prayer, would you?